Okay, hello. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Nadia Tuma Weldon. I'm Global Head of Thought Leadership at McCann World Group and EVP of Truth Central, which is the agency's global intelligence unit. Very happy to be here. Also happy to be here with you all today. My name is Jess Francis. I'm a senior strategist as well as the co-lead of our sustainability global practice at McCann World Group. Great. So as I said, we're very happy to be here. And we were actually here one year ago when we presented a first look at the global findings from our proprietary Truth About Sustainability study. Now, while it seems like a lot longer, it's true that that really was only 2021. But it's fair to say that the world has changed quite a bit since then. At this time last year, the pandemic in the West still seemed uncertain. We had Delta and Omicron variants causing disruption, but we were well on our way to vaccinating the public and there was some hope that things would improve. There was also lots of positivity uh, around the world as leaders gathered in Glasgow for COP26, signaling a renewed commitment to battling climate change globally. Now, at that time, we had just completed a major piece of global research around the topic of sustainability with a methodology that you can see here. We took a deeply human lens, conducting tens of thousands of interviews of normal people across two dozen markets to dig into their daily lived experience, attitudes, and behaviors around this critical topic. Now, within that context, we had identified five shifts that we believed would guide brands on their sustainability journey. And although a year has passed, we find that these shifts are enduring and will continue to define this space. And we're gonna explore that in this presentation. So in fact, over the last year, we have evolved this piece of research to transcend its sort of initial global findings. We explored how this topic manifests across markets, including the US, Germany, and France, revealing fascinating nuances specific to culture. We've also explored how the metaverse can be a tool for furthering sustainability, and we've even taken a lens of the topic through the issues relating to female sexual health. It's clear that this topic extends into every part of our lives, and we continue to investigate that through different angles, as you see here. So that's a look at the past year. And the question now becomes, where are we today? We don't need to tell you that the past year has not seen fewer crises, but unfortunately more. From China's zero COVID policy to the threat of monkeypox to a full scale war in Europe to the subsequent cost of living crisis, which some are calling a recession, it's clear that world events will continue to compound and cause more stress around the globe. And so it's no surprise that in our research, 80% of people say that they are worried that the world is reaching some kind of tipping point. On top of the 24 seven news cycle, reminding us of the terrible events shaping our world, there is a near constant drumbeat in the background of the impending threat of climate collapse, while world leaders do little more than make voluntary non-binding pledges to do better. As you can see here, in this illustration that went viral during the pandemic, where the little people in the city are saying, just wash your hands and all will be well while the tsunamis of biodiversity collapse come our way. Now, crucially, despite all the talk about ESGs, SDGs and COPs, we're still seeing a rise in emissions year on year. And we see this increasing concern as a result reflected in our data, with a net global worry about climate change increasing from 31% just a year ago in 2021 to 38% in 2022, a relatively significant change in just one year. And this is part of a broader segmentation analysis that we conducted, measuring changes in attitudes year over year. It follows then that if we look at our groups of anxious activists growing, it's important to note that at the same time, reality refuters, those who do not believe that climate change is real, has more than halved in the last year to 3% of the global population. We believe that the more that these world events continue to show that climate change affects everything, the more, quote, real the issue becomes among everyday people. And perhaps that's why there's so much gloom around the stories we tell about this crisis. As Rebecca Thomas of the Financial Times recently wrote, to consider real climate action and the complicated nature of climate change itself is exhausting, emotionally and mentally. 
It asks us to rethink not only our own daily lives, but the structure of our cultures, our societies, and our politics. No wonder then that so often calls to action are replaced with simplistic images of total and swift annihilation, images that are painful yet ask very little of us. But it's important in this important dynamic that there is the opportunity because our aim is not to add more doom and gloom to the conversation, but rather reveal the real tangible and meaningful ways that we as brands and marketers can come together to create hope and action for a brighter future. Because as we revealed in the findings last year, the responsibility for change does not lay solely on the shoulders of the individual, which is a narrative that we often hear. And here is where we want to revisit one of the most powerful pieces of data from our original study. And it is crucial for brands and marketers to sharpen their efforts in solving this problem because the responsibility does not lie, again, on the shoulders of the people who buy our brands. When we ask people who is responsible for reversing climate change, the answer is clear. It is a three-legged stool of shared responsibility between individuals, brands, and governments. And while this may seem like the world's most depressing presentation, we assure you it is not. We still believe in hope and action as the most positive pairing towards a bright future. And as we've seen, while the world continues to be in turmoil, there is a key role for brands to shape the narrative, behaviors, and outcomes despite that. And going back just briefly to the cost of living crisis, as companies experience an economic downturn, it may be easy to lose focus on sustainability endeavors. But in fact, research over the years has shown that brands and companies that continue to innovate, not necessarily invest in these areas, fare better in the long run. This is the time to invite and welcome opportunities that may lead to new areas of growth. A survey of 1,300 small businesses conducted by Green America, EcoVentures, and the Association for Enterprise Opportunity found that sales of green products increased and even outpaced traditional alternatives during the 2008 recession. In fact, they found that the greener the product was, the more likely its sales increased. Almost 60% of the survey respondents expanded their green offerings, and most indicated that these resulted in higher revenues and increased competitiveness during the downturn. So today we want to revisit our original five key shifts from our study last year to see how brands have stepped up to play a key role in taking action around sustainability while growing their brand and business in new areas, audiences, and ideas. So our first shift was and is from climate eclipse to deeply human stories. Now, just to recap from last year, I certainly do not need to point out to this audience that the topic of sustainability is absolutely everywhere in culture, but we found in our research a key point that a that sometimes goes overlooked. As we saw, we're still not making the necessary change to drive down emissions and connect to true action. Our question was why? Well, we talk endlessly about saving the environment and protecting the planet and lowering emissions, but it occurred to us that we could be talking about sustainability the wrong way and that that discourse was hindering real progress. Because in the research, when we ask everyday people in our global study to identify the number one definition they associate with sustainability, it's no surprise that the answer is protecting the planet. But we also were not satisfied with just that story. So we dug deeper and we asked people to take a step back and actually describe their own personal relationship with sustainability, which is where we uncovered a different story and a key finding of our study because there we received hundreds of photos from our qualitative exercise that showed all of these beautiful pieces of daily life, including the food people ate, their gardens, their homes. But I think the thing that struck us the most was sharing pictures of their loved ones and themselves. And this idea of future generations living in their own homes and looking them right in the eye. Because the truth is that sustainability isn't something separate from us. It's not just the planet or the environment. It really represents us and our survival as a species. So it's clear that we need to harness this shift from how we approach this complex topic, from this climate eclipse to deeply human stories. A key mechanism that can be at play in doing so is mainstream entertainment, pop culture. When we watch stories and movies and TV and even broader content, it creates empathy and understanding, leading to new attitudes and behaviors in the real world. But maybe we don't have enough of these stories that are humanizing this critical topic. In a recent analysis looking into nearly 40,000 film and TV scripts over the last five years, a team of researchers found that only 0.6% mentioned the words climate change. 
clearly this topic is not getting attention from pop culture discourse. And going back to our introduction, there are creative and deeply human ways of bringing these stories into people's living rooms, or indeed screens of any kind. One use might be comedy, an unexpected way to unlock connection with the urgency of climate change, rather than relying on those tropes of gloom and doom and despair. And maybe that's why Adam McKay's movie last year, Don't Look Up, resonated so deeply with audiences. The story outlined the crisis as clearly as any David Attenborough documentary, but used character, plot, and emotion, and comedy to truly connect. As Dr. Ayana Johnson, a climate activist and oceanographer, writes in this article, the point of all of this is to welcome more and more people into the work of driving forward climate solutions. And we are seeing an increase of organizations that are created to even tell these stories, like Good Energy Stories, a service that connects storytelling consultants with companies looking to develop more stories to connect with everyday people. Because there is demand for them, and over the past year, we've seen brands and businesses start to step up to become content creators as well as advocates for more of a human perspective on the climate crisis. For example, the outdoor powerhouse REI, whose in-house content arm, Co-op Studios, has teamed up with Reciprocity Project, which is a collaboration between nonprofits Mia Taro and Upstander Project for the series of original short films made by Indigenous directors on their homeland. According to REI, the series celebrates cultures and learnings from Indigenous communities across Turtle Island in the U.S. and Colombia. And the filmmakers worked alongside community partners to infuse the films with perspectives on reciprocity in relationships to the land and animals around them. It's clear that through learning about culture and people's lives, there's far more emotion, understanding, and ways to help than speaking solely about materials, targets, and pledges. As Tracy Rector, Reciprocity's project executive producer says, stories from indigenous peoples about being in reciprocity with the earth are essential in delivering messages of truth, healing, and transformative change. Many of you may have heard about the Eat a Swede campaign, which won big at Cannes this year, a provocative way of literally bringing humans into the sustainability conversation. The message, the global population is expected to reach 10 billion people by 2050, and with it, the planet's food demand will skyrocket nearly 100%. As such, the time to act on climate is now, and Sweden is ready to lead by example. The goal of the campaign is to strengthen the reputation of the Swedish food industry, thus paving the way for increased consumption of domestic food in Sweden and exporting sustainable solutions to drive the category of conscious food consumption. What better way to talk about climate change and the impacts of food waste than through a mockumentary about cannibalism? But beyond communications, there are ways to tell the story of our positive impact on individual lives and livelihoods of the climate crisis. Michelob Ultra Beer launched Contract for Change, when digging into the reason why only 1% of U.S. farmland is organic, the company found that going organic is extremely challenging for struggling family farms, the cost, the infrastructure, despite their best intentions. So Michelob Ultra Pure Gold has taken on the mission of transforming America's agriculture with Contract for Change, an agreement that farmers signed today that guarantees them a buyer in three years when their organic transition is complete, removing that big barrier. Contract for Change was offered to all American farmers. Over 100,000 acres are in transition today and will soon produce ingredients for Michelob Ultra's Pure Gold and countless other brands, producing real impact for American farmers and obviously contributing to massive strides in organic farming. So when we think about moving from the climate eclipse to deeply human stories, we realize that truly placing the lives and livelihoods of billions of people at the heart of our sustainability strategies will encourage connection, compassion, and true progress. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jess to take you through our next shift. Thanks so much, Nadia. So we're moving on to our next shift, which is from changing culture to enriching culture. As a research team who has been decoding humans and culture for more than a decade, we know that cultural context matters. Marketing messages and initiatives may tend to fall flat if a one-size-fits-all approach occurs to solve sustainability. We began to see how culture can play a crucial role in the last chapter, and there's major opportunity in order to sort of drive action when you're culturally nuanced. So now before we go into it, for a, brute, for a few brief seconds, I want you to imagine a perfect environmentalist. Think about what they look like. Think about what their behavior is. Maybe there's someone who recycles perfectly. Maybe they never forget their reusable coffee cup at home. Maybe they cycle or take public transportation everywhere. 
But the truth of the matter is, it's hard to be perfect and on top of it 24-7. The reality is, it's messy and complicated. And as one of our respondents told us best, we don't need a few people to be perfectly sustainable. We need everyone to try their best. So where can you start? The answer is culture. In our research, we asked people all over the world to tell us the actions they're willing to do to tackle climate change. This was one of the most compelling pieces of data we uncovered because it reveals such rich cultural nuance about how brands can turbocharge existing cultural behaviors rather than impose a perfect vision of environmentalism on their customers. So if we take a look at India, for example, where many people are vegetarian due to religious, spiritual, and financial reasons, respondents are most likely to say they're willing to give up meat to fight climate change. In Germany, a hotbed of engineering and good design, people are most likely to say they would buy products that are designed to last for a long time. Or in Colombia, where we see people are most willing to commute by bicycle, this is a country that has a strong love and passion for one of its most popular national sports, which is cycling. So ultimately, if we want to spark change, it's about meeting people where they are, starting with that low-hanging fruit within their culture. And it snowballs from there to create more and more behavior change. It's a first step that can lead to more and more sustainability on a grander scale. So here are a couple of examples of people that we've been really sort of inspired by when it comes to tapping into cultural behaviors. You may all be familiar with the German food producer Rügenwalde Müller, a company that has been around since 1834. Originally known for their production of the famous German sausage, in 2014, they began to produce meatless alternatives. And in 2020, that sale of their meat alternatives actually surpassed the sale of meat products for the first time. And they're seeking to expand further and further into vegetarian and vegan foods. And so much so, they're now the market leader in this category in Germany. It shows how this heritage German brand continues to honor German culture and tradition, especially in their communications, but continues to innovate in order to meet changing culture and demand, thus bridging the old with the new. Another example we love from this year is when Love Island partnered with eBay UK. This past summer, the Islanders shared a wardrobe and wore pre-loved items throughout the season. Almost immediately upon the season's launch, eBay UK reported a 700% increase in searches for pre-loved fashion, and seller listings on eBay actually increased by 1,000% within three months of the partnership being announced. This really demonstrates that success can occur when you showcase behavior change through a beloved institution. And while many reality TV shows encourage excessive consumption, this partnership flips the whole equation on its head by instead encouraging viewers to embrace sustainable glamour. So when we think about making real change in the markets in which we operate, it's key that we meet people where they are and tap into existing cultural behaviors in order to encourage new and positive habits from a culturally nuanced foundation. And Nadia will be taking you through the next shift. Thanks, Jess. So just to recap our third shift, which is about less stuff to more living. I think we've talked a lot now just about how cultural context and nuance is critical to achieving sustainability goals. But in our research, there was actually one theme that seemed to transcend culture. And that theme was shame. And specifically the shame that people felt when they think that they're failing in their sustainability actions. Because we continuously see the guilt that people feel when their habits don't really realize in a world that's not set up to encourage sustainable behavior. So in our research, we heard from a woman in Japan who feels guilty when she uses plastic bags at the market, to a man in the UK who said he feels guilty because he still drives a diesel car, and of course, to a man in Canada who admits he doesn't actually know what to put in the recycling bin. And the problem that we had uncovered with this is that shame and guilt really makes people feel bad and not good. And I think even worse, it leads to inaction and paralysis. So people feel like, why even bother contributing if they're only going to fail? And unfortunately, most of the mainstream messaging only conspires against us. You only need to look at headlines to see how sustainability is simply framed as an exercise in deprivation and sacrifice. So we often say, given the study, that sustainability has a bit of a communications problem. But what we think is so important is shifting the conversation from being less about less to more about more, and really thinking about how to solve the sustainability issue in a way that gives people more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. And we're so heartened to see over the last year that a range of brands have really harnessed this shift, reframing sustainability as an exercise in abundance rather than deprivation. 
One of our favorite examples of this in action is over in New York City, activist and entrepreneur, general cool girl, Lauren Singer, who, by the way, has only created one mason jar full of trash over many years, founded Package Free Shop, a zero-way shop in the heart of New York. The business first opened as a pop-up and then permanent store in progressive Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It speaks volumes that the store has now opened on New York's chic Bond Street in the heart of Manhattan. Aesthetics matter clearly, and while zero waste may seem like a really restrictive way to live, Lauren Singer has demonstrated that it can be cool, hip, sexy, and beautiful. And by av advocating against creating trash, she has created a follower of young and young at heart customers seeking the abundance of living a lower waste lifestyle. Our second example here actually doesn't come from a brand, but we couldn't resist telling this wonderful story from Germany that shows just how to elevate sustainability to a level that benefits a community. To be fair, last year we also looked at France, which by the way, has recently banned advertisements by fossil fuel companies. But over in the German city of Andernach, a city center has fruit and vegetable gardens that anyone can harvest for free. Their motto is, feel free to pick. So when we think about encouraging people to adopt more sustainability behaviors, we should be reframing them as life enhancing, indulgent, beautiful, not less than. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Jess, who's gonna take us into our fourth shift. So this shift is all about from hard decisions to easy defaults. If you remember at the start of this talk, when Nadia shared that our respondents believe the share of responsibility for reversing climate change rests across individuals, governments, brands, and businesses. So it begs the question, if everyone is responsible, why are companies putting people in the position to choose? Because the truth is, in that many cases, we're putting everyday consumers in the position of making incredibly complex eco calculations on what products to buy and what brand aligns with certain values, thus placing sort of undue pressure on the individual part of the equation. And even though the majority of global brands right now are making strides with their commitments and innovations and product offerings, people are still struggling to make the right choices, especially given the increase in cost of living. Affordability is a huge concern for people in this current moment. And we really heard this in the research with one of our respondents sharing with us, until sustainability becomes affordable, until it matches, if not beats, the price of the less conscious products, consumers will have a reason to pay for it. And this is why we subscribe to this philosophy of eco-accidentalism. This is the simple, elegant idea that the most sustainable choice is also the default. And when we think to the last shift that Nadia shared, it's also the most desirable. So while it can feel like brands are under pressure to always tout their sustainability ambitions, if we can make these choices so easy as to feel effortless, our customers will benefit. Supermarket giant Aldi is piloting a new eco-concept store specifically designed to reduce carbon consumption while also making it easier for shoppers to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Shown here is the concept store in Leamington Spa. The store's design is estimated to reduce life cycle carbon emissions of up to two thirds. It'll also be trialing a new number of plastic reduction initiatives, allowing the supermarket to test and learn which elements work best. These elements will include packaging free refill stations, recycling units, energy initiatives, and as well as creating a space for consumers to drop off those hard to recycle items that we might accumulate. The goal of this is to have these stores roll out across the country. Aldi is reimagining the supermarket as the beginning and end of a consumer's sustainability journey, a space that really enables more sustainable living. Another grocery chain we've been inspired by is Marks & Spencer's. They've recently decided to take the best before dates off of more than 300 fruit and vegetable items, all in a bid to tackle food waste. These will be replaced by a code that m and staff can use to check freshness and quality. And while initially this may cause some adjustment for those of us to tell, you know, whether an avocado has gone off or if this apple is good to eat, this move will incite behavior change, and it'd be up to all of us to assess whether food is safe to eat or in fresh condition, and this is perhaps knowledge that has been lost in modern society. And it's a pretty big deal. Removing dates off of fresh fruit and vegetables can save the equivalent of 7 million shopping baskets of food being binned at home. And so if we think about going from hard decisions to easy defaults, we as companies can set up the most sustainable option to be the default option. And thinking about our previous shift, it should also be the most aspirational and desirable one. 
Now, if that sounds like a bit like a tall order that will require tons of resources and innovation, that is true. But the great news is that by placing creativity at the center of all we do, these ideas will naturally come to the fore, which takes us to our fifth and final shift for Nadia to go through. Great. So this final shift is from creative messaging to creative business. So as a recap, we talked to lots of experts during the journey of this global research. And the thing that we kept hearing time and time again is that if we really want to be serious about addressing this crisis, we can't simply tweak our businesses around the edges. We need to fundamentally rethink the ways in which we live and we do business. And this absolutely requires all of that science and all the engineers and all the climatologists. But the thing is, we also need dreamers and creatives to drive change. In fact, our research revealed that 77% of people globally believe that brands have a greater ability to make positive change than the government does. That is some pretty incredible power. And while, of course, the government needs to act quickly to fundamentally address these critical issues, what we love about this piece of data is that it reveals a very potent role for brands to play around the world. And I have to bring back our favorite quote that we had in our original study, which is from the activist Mara Anais Hegler, who said, the thing about climate is that you can either be overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem or fall in love with the creativity of the solutions. Now, we couldn't speak about brand new businesses and creativity without talking about Patagonia's groundbreaking announcement a few weeks ago. Patagonia shifting their entire company structure in which the company's primary stakeholder is planet Earth. The company acknowledged that no good options existed, and so they had to create their own. Every dollar that is now reinvested back into Patagonia will be distributed as dividends to protect the planet, which the company expects to amount to roughly $100 million a year. Patagonia emphasized that it will remain a B Corp and will continue to give 1% of its sales to grassroots activists. Now, it's easy to try and poke holes in this strategy, where the money goes, which taxes have been avoided, but the creativity and bravery of this action attempting to be reached cannot be denied. It's a game changer for global business and a direction of where we could go. Similarly, Faith in Nature, which sells soap and hair care products, as well as household cleaners and shampoo for dogs, says it's the first company in the world to give nature a formal vote on corporate decisions that might affect it. A new non-executive director will join the company's next board meeting later this month to speak on behalf of the natural world. The first person to hold the position is Bronte Ansel, senior lecturer in law in Essex Law School and the director of lawyers for nature, who told The Guardian her role would be similar to a guardian acting on behalf of a child in a court of law. Now, we often say at our teams that sustainability isn't a competition. In fact, no one's going to win at sustainability. And when we think about creative business and how creativity grows, the more sectors, companies, and cultures come together to solve the world's most pressing issues. And, of course, the 17th Sustainable Development Goal is partnerships. Sometimes the more unexpected, the better. So Mercedes-Benz and Microsoft have announced plans to collaborate to make vehicle production more efficient, resilient, and sustainable. The new MO360 data platform will allow Mercedes to connect around 30 passenger car plants worldwide to the Microsoft cloud, enhancing transparency and predictability across the digital production and supply chain. Now, while that might sound like a mouthful, what this does is to help other companies speed up their efforts to be more sustainable. This platform helps companies reduce their environmental impact, and it continues to add features and updates the platform with support of Microsoft partners. The good news is that as we've seen, sustainability can come from so many different places, expertise and ideas, and putting it at the heart of our brand purpose, our mission, our vision, our role in the world, we can unleash the most creative ways to benefit people, planet and product. Now, I know we just took you through quite a lot of information, so I'm just going to quickly summarize the shifts that we discussed and potentially a question that we can keep in mind as we move forward. So our first shift was from the climate eclipse to human stories. How can we use storytelling and human truths to impact change? From changing culture to enriching culture, how can we tap into deep cultural nuances to build more of a foundation of change? Now, moving from less stuff to more living, how could we elevate sustainability to be an exercise in abundance and joy? From hard decisions to easy defaults, how can we make sustainability so easy as to feel lazy? And lastly, from creative messaging to creative business, 
how do we harness creativity to put sustainability at the heart of everything that we do? Because in the end, shouldn't all brands be sustainable brands?